to know the speaker. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, this woman who I have admired so much over the years. Carrie Robinson is the founding executive director of the National Leadership Roundtable on Church Management, which is dedicated to promoting excellence and best practices in the management, finances, and human resource development of the Catholic Church in the United States. Carrie is a member of the Rascob Foundation for Catholic Activities and a member of the Board of Directors of FATICA, Foundations and Donors Interested in Catholic Activities. She is the founding editor of the Catholic Funding Guide, a directory of resources for Catholic activities, and has been an advisor to and trustee of numerous grant-making foundations, charitable nonprofits, and family philanthropies since 1990. Carrie served as the Director of Development for the Catholic Center at Yale University and led a successful multi-million dollar fundraising drive to expand and endow the Center's intellectual and spiritual ministry and to construct a Catholic Student Center on Yale's campus. She and her husband, Dr. Michael Capello, have two children, Christopher and Sophie. Please help me welcome Carrie Robinson. So thank you so much for including me. This is my first visit to Idaho, and I have loved it. The hospitality and welcome has been palpable and it is a great privilege for me to be included in your conference. What I'd like to do today is speak about four particular formative experiences that I have had, which help to illuminate my uh, dedication to the Catholic Church, my love of the Catholic Church, and my sense of stewardship. But I am particularly highlighting these four organizations because they should properly be regarded as ongoing resources to you in your own ministry. And after briefly describing these four experiences, I'm going to conclude with 12 maxims and charisms that help to give voice to authentic spiritual life and correlate with successful development. <clears throat> All of this is uh, with a view to establishing a framework for being worthy of great generosity. So first, I was by sheer accident of birth born to a family that now has a 65 year formal philanthropic history in service to the Catholic Church at the local diocesan, national, and international level. It's called the Raskob family, and my great-grandparents, John and Helen Araska, 65 years ago, set up a private foundation and with two intentions in mind. The first was that they wanted all of their resources to be used exclusively to support the Catholic Church. But they left that intentionally broad. So essentially, anything the Catholic Church is interested in anywhere in the world is technically eligible for funding. It doesn't limit the pool very much since the church is so actively engaged in all of, of life. The second is that they wanted their children and descendants to be stewards of the foundation's resources. Now, this would have been very simple, but John and Helena had 13 children, <laughs> one of whom my grandmother had 14 children, and my husband and I do not have 16 children, we have two, but the family is, is enormous. And in this uh, invitation extended by our great grandparents to serve as volunteers, as stewards of the fam family's resources, we got exposed to the Catholic Church at its very best. And I can remember as a child meeting people like you men and women, ordained religious and lay, whose sense of faith and its lived expression in the world was so compelling to me as a child. You are my heroes and heroines, 
as they were. I remember being struck by a couple of things about these holy men and women. It didn't matter whether they were ministering to the dying in Calcutta or trying to fight for justice in Southside Chicago. They all possessed this palpable sense of joy. I remember being so struck by the fact that they were seeing, in some cases, the very worst of our world, and yet they were grounded. Their lives were imbued with purpose. They knew who they were and whose they were. They radiated Christ's love for humankind. And they had this joy and confidence and freedom. And I remember thinking, I want to be like them. I want to be like you. But I also knew that I would never be that holy. And so I said um, to myself as a child, and this continued to be my life's prayer, maybe I could do something with my life that would positively impact the ministry of these holy men and women that are so inspiring to me. And that has really truly been my life's prayer, and I think is the reason why I find myself such an unlikely candidate to serve in such creative leadership positions in service to the church. The second formative experience in my life was being asked to serve as the Director of Development for St. Thomas More, the Catholic Chapel and Center at Yale University. I should have never been asked to take that job. I had no experience in fundraising whatsoever. I knew how to make good grants from that side of the coin, but I had never so much as participated in a bake sale at my children's school. And nevertheless, when asked to pray about this invitation, I realized that it was not an invitation to raise money to give Yale one more thing to boast about. It was an invitation to help a remarkable Catholic priest and pastor bring to fruition all the potential at hand. And when successful, we would help to raise the bar of Catholic campus ministry across the country. And in that context, after praying about it, I accepted the invitation. And the 10 years that I spent as a development director uh, on Yale's campus uh, changed my life. It has made me much, much better in philanthropy. And my experience in philanthropy um, led for a um, a, a better development experience. The third formative experience is my association with FATICA. FATICA, Foundations and Donors Interested in Catholic Activities, is now 36 years old. It was started by Raskop and a small cohort of other family foundations all of those years ago when we realized that we were funding many of the same apostolates and ministries and Catholic institutions. And it occurred to us that it would behoove our philanthropy if we introduced ourselves to one another, began to collaborate in response to meeting the, the church's needs, and be more effective at maximizing the grant dollar. This has been a remarkable contribution to the church uh, FATICA's network has, because they are always asking themselves, how can we do more for the church than simply writing smart checks? It, is there uh, some way that we can be additionally beneficial by introducing like-minded apostolates who may not be aware of each other, or um, setting a stage for proactive, creative brainstorming um, to give birth to a new and necessary ministry. And the fourth is the organization that I now direct called the National Leadership Roundtable on Church Management. This is exactly six years old, um, although there were many years prior to that when we were deliberating how best to harness the considerable competencies and expertise of senior level executives from all walks of life in service to the church's temporal affairs. But it has been a remarkable experience and a humbling privilege for me to serve the church in this capacity by bringing together such extraordinary leaders from the army, from the higher education, from the church itself, from the international corporate world, from the financial world, from the secular nonprofit world, from Philanthropy. Every sector and industry you can imagine has a Catholic at its head. 
and Catholics have risen to levels of affluence and influence in this country that is staggering. The Leadership Roundtable harnesses that considerable expertise and it brings those collective competencies together, those intellectual and problem-solving capabilities and creativity, and it focuses on the managerial and financial and communications and human resource challenges facing our church in this country. It, is done, it does so with a profound sense of love for the church, of fidelity to the church, of confidence in the future, uh, and uh, a remarkable, it is a remarkable expression in and of itself of authentic Christian stewardship. So those four um, experiences have formed the person that I am today and the 12 charisms that I would like to share with you toward being worthy of generosity. The first and foremost is gratitude. All of us should properly be grateful for the church, for its role in our, in our lives, in how it has formed us as adult, mature Catholics. Henry Nowen, before he died, I had the exquisite privilege of meeting with him. I was enormously pregnant. And he said to this small group of Catholic students, the central goal in all of our lives is to know that we are radically, unalterably loved by God just for being you. That that is the task, to know that you are radically loved by God just for being you. And he said, it sounds simple, but it's hard to do. But when in your prayer you get to that point where you know that you are radically loved by God, your response is one of overwhelming gratitude. It's kind of like falling in love and being in love with someone and realizing they are in love with you too. You're overwhelmed with gratitude and, and most importantly, a desire to give, to be generative, to be fruitful um, and out of gratitude. I think this insight that Henry shared with me and that he's written, written about is an <clears throat> important foundation for any discussion about stewardship. It really should begin and end in gratitude. And he said, um, when you have this, this insight and you live out of this spirituality, out of this sense of gratitude, you want to be fruitful with your life. The best way to love God back is to be fruitful with your life. So again, picture, I'm hugely pregnant, and I ask the question, I get the be fruitful and multiply part, <laughs> but what does it mean to be fruitful with your life in this context? And he said, it's simple. To love God back means to love all that God loves and to care for all that God cares for. And that seems so central to stewardship. It is the first step to wanting to be worthy of generosity. When you are radically committed to mission, whether it is the mission of your parish, the mission of your diocese, the mission of your religious community, your social justice apostolate, when you're radically committed to mission, you want excellence across the board for the sake of that mission. Nothing short of aspiring to excellence should do. You want excellence because you are committed to mission and you realize how urgent and necessary and life-giving that mission is. Well, that sense of desire for excellence for the sake of mission must extend comprehensively and include the temporal affairs of living out of that mission. That means if you are committed to the mission of your parish, it matters how the parish is managed, how finances are accounted for, how budgets are set, how accountable we are. These things, how we manage um, people and facilities and finances, are part of being committed to mission and wanting excellence for the sake of that mission. 
I believe profoundly that development is a ministry itself. I'm sure I'm speaking to the choir here. I would imagine that most, if not all of you, also believe that the activity of development is in and of itself a ministry. I can back that up with an important story. When I was working on behalf of St. Thomas More at Yale with Father Bob Boulogne, the Catholic chaplain, we had uh, basically broken every possible rule of development that there is. And this was not out of defiance, it was simply out of ignorance. Neither of us were really properly trained or equipped to conduct this um, activity. But we were committed to creating and bringing to fruition a Catholic intellectual and spiritual center of excellence. So among the many things, rules that we broke, we announced publicly a capital campaign when we had not raised any money at all. We never did a feasibility study. Um, so if you take, don't take these things home with you because I'm, I'm telling you things not to do, but, but it, um, when we announced the campaign, in our enthusiasm, there was this gentleman, very shabbily dressed, sitting in the back of the room. And afterwards, he approached our, the president of our board and he said, I'd like to get involved, I'd like to help. And so I was so eager for anybody to be responsive to our vision that I couldn't wait to engage him, despite the fact that he clearly was not a, a man of affluence, but at least he got the vision. So we began a relationship with him, and um, it turns out that the, the very fact that we were treating all people with the integrity that is incumbent upon us as Christians, that, that um, this man ended up being actually a man of, of considerable affluence. And I think he was so impressed that we were meeting him on just on his terms without knowing his, his background. In any case, many, many years of relationship with him in, ensued, and the capital campaign got off to a great start. He um, was going to make a, um, an enormous gift to us. And he was just about to, he was, he was really, uh, his gift was so consequential that our new center was going to be named for him. And on this particular uh, day, it was Easter Sunday, the high point of our liturgical calendar, he came to Mass at St. Thomas More's Chapel. And of course, as you can imagine on that occasion, the, the chapel was full to overflowing with students and faculty, the music was exquisite, the flowers were perfect, the homily was masterful, and my husband and I were sitting with him very close to the front. And I noticed that he was quietly weeping throughout the entire liturgy. But I also knew what a deeply private, humble man he was, that, and he would have hated for any attention to have been placed on him, especially in that context. So I just noted how moved he was during this liturgy. Mass ends where we are sent forward, and we're um, taking a long, slow time to get out of the chapel because it's so packed, and I turn to him and I say, Thank you so much for choosing this holy place and this sacred day to join us for the celebration of the Eucharist. It is such a pleasure to have you with us. And he says, I probably should not confess this to you, Carrie, but this is my first Mass in over 40 years. And I remember thinking, if he never gives us a dollar, if nothing comes of this capital campaign, if the center isn't built, if the programs aren't enacted, we will have achieved something profoundly significant in reconciling this man with his God and with his faith community. And as soon as I put him in his car, I went running to Father Bob and I said, I told you it is ministry! <laughs> Money follows mission. Hopefully you have heard that 
both um, over these two days. And, and, and I hope that you hear that anytime you hear anything about stewardship, money follows mission. And development is a ministry. When we first started, I remember thinking, why isn't this working? Why do I have this extraordinarily pastorally excellent chaplain who just gets tongue-tied in any kind of meeting with prospective donors? Like, what is that about? And, and he and I were both trying to figure out our way in this. And I realized that there were there are so many obstacles to effective Catholic fundraising. One one just observation is the negative language we employ. Hit her up for money. Put the squeeze on him. Target them. And I thought I, I'm not a violent person, and yet this is the language that is that is being associated with my role here. Um, I had one trustee after we had had. Um, raised some significant funds and started to expand the program, added a third Sunday liturgy for Yale students because students were, were coming. He meant it as a compliment, but it was really good. It was really shocking to me. He said about my ability to raise money to another uh, prospective donor, watch out for Carrie. She'll take a bite out of your pant leg and get some flesh with it. And I thought, this is horrible, I am not a violent person. Why, why is the language of violation associated with raising money? And so we started to pray about that. I definitely think there's some theological ambivalence we have about wealth. Is it holy? Is it sinful? If it's holy, is it only under certain circumstances? Those are questions that have to be wrestled with, spoken about candidly, prayed about, and addressed. Otherwise, you enter into the Ministry of Development with cognitive dissonance, and that shows. So, <clears throat> Father Bob and I, we prayed a lot about this, and we talked a lot about it, and we came to the realization that we were looking at donors as objects to try to get as much money out of as quickly as possible, rather than as subjects in their own right. And as soon as Father Bob was able to make that shift and see donors, prospective donors, as subjects in their own right, people like all of us who are deeply searching for meaning, who want to contribute something of value, something life-giving for others, something um, grounded in faith, something Christ-like, then his conversations with donors became like all of his pastoral in interactions. That is to say, he was able to bring his full, confident, joyful, attentive self to the discussion. And everything changed from that point on. Another charism, um, and if, if you're counting, this is number seven. <laughs> uh, joy. Joy is an absolutely essential ingredient to this work being done effectively. I also think it's a hallmark of authentic spiritual life. Joy, absolutely important. When I was at the Divinity School, I had a classmate who went on to become a lay ecclesial minister working in a Catholic parish. A remarkable woman. And she was on vacation and she was traveling. Now, it was nowhere in the Northwest probably um, more on the East Coast, but she went to Mass at this parish that she was unfamiliar with. And afterwards she told me about it, and she said it was just so stultifying. The pastor was, it was like he was just going through the motions. Everything was by rote. There was no enthusiasm. There wasn't any, any relevance or, or, or joyfulness. It was just so lackluster that Mass became an occasion of sin for me. And she said, um, she said, I wanted to go up to the pastor at the end and say, Father, I know that this is the holy sacrifice of the Mass, but you are not the one being sacrificed. <laughs> when we first started working on the development effort together, at Christmas time, Father Bob gave me a plaque that said, it can be done. And our work was arduous. The obstacles we had to overcome were huge. We had to take um, a deficit and, and turn it into something that was positive. Uh, 
Um, so this, it can be done, became an important mantra for us. But the next year, I gave him a present for Christmas, and it was a plaque, equally as beautiful, that said, it can be fun. <laughs> <laughs> One evening, I was uh, preparing for the next day's board meeting. And even though we were expanding the program and we had added this third Sunday liturgy and um, we had all of this signs of fruitfulness, students were attending, their moms and dads were not making them go to mass, these brilliant young adults were participating actively in the life of the church through this Newman Center. And I was properly proud of connecting program with development and I was arguing to the board all the time this is our first task, to be worthy of generosity, to live out of mission. We can't wait to raise the money and then live out of mission. We have to live out of mission right now. And when we do that authentically and well, the money will follow. But they, my trustees, smart galleys for sure, um, were really hard on us. And they said, I don't want to hear any more from you about the program or the increased students. I just want to know how much has been raised since the board last met. Well, this was incredibly painful to me because I wanted them properly to be focused on what our real purpose was, the expansion of ministries, elevating Catholic intellectual discourse, making faith relevant to young adults, forming them in adult, mature faith life. And they wanted the bottom line. Uh, so on this particular evening, I'm, I'm crafting my remarks to the board, and I look at my wall of crucifixes, and I say, God, please help me with the language to keep the board engaged and confident in this process, because I know we are going to be successful. I know this is of the spirit. Help me with the language to persuade them not to give up, to stick with it, to have confidence in the future. And the phone rang. And it was a man from Seattle, far as far away from Yale as we could practically get, in his 80s. And he said, I know I'm calling late for East Coast time. I'm glad I caught you. My wife and I have been so inspired by the advancement of program, the advancement of intellectual and spiritual formation that is happening on Yale's campus through the Catholic Center. So inspired are we that we would like to commit a million dollars. And I said, is this God? <laughs> I could not believe it. I could not believe it. And, and so I began to thank him profusely. And he said, furthermore, my wife and I have so much confidence in the leadership, Father Bob and you, in your, your team there. Use this money however you see best. No restrictions on it. You can use it to pay off old debt, build the building, an endowment fund program. We trust you. Use it as you see best. So I was crying and I thanked him and I began to explain that I have this board meeting the next day. Um, how incredibly important the timing of this was, and it was an answer to prayer and affirming and validating, and I was thanking him and thanking him, and he cut me off and he said, Carrie, don't thank me. You, and he meant that plural, you make it a joy to give. A joy to give. Now my husband says that I was clearly not doing my job well because you're supposed to give till it hurts, but that's the old model in the negative language. You make it a joy to give. He saw it as finally, after 80 years, being invited to contribute to something that he was so glad to be a part of. Eighth, if your intentions are sound, some good will always come of it. This kind of work, and the bigger the consequence, requires unbelievable fidelity to purpose. You cannot give up. Um, here's an example of, uh, of how this played out in, in, our, in our work. One of my tasks was, at the beginning of every semester, to sit Father Bob down. We would take out our calendars, and we would block off days over the course of the semester these days were sacrosanct for campaign travel. 
and I would take those days and I would pick a city in the, in the United States where there were Yale Catholic alumni, and I would try to fill up Father Bob's dance card. And, um, and this was the first time a Catholic chaplain had ever left Yale's campus to meet with Catholic alumni, but very important, that personal engagement and relationship. And on this particular day, about halfway through the campaign, we um, were going to Boston, which meant a two and a half hour drive up, and I only had one appointment. But we saw this, this donor, he gave us 30 minutes of his time, we were able to cut to the chase, give the vision, <laughs> talk about what we were most proud of, the different um, programmatic developments, and he said, I'm, I'm persuaded you are doing great work, thank you for your time, Here's a check for $25,000. I really appreciate it, and I will be keeping you in my prayers. So we get back into the car, and Father Bob begins the two and a half hour drive to say, I can't believe I took an entire day out of you know, my, my busy active ministry, and we only had this one appointment, and that was so dismissive, Carrie. And so the poor guy, because it was a long drive, I said, Father Bob, all we can do is our absolute best every single day. We can't predict how and when the fruit of our labor is going to materialize. But if we give up, if we say, for example, oh, you know, there's only one appointment, let's scrap it, let's not visit him, that would be an, an abnegation of our responsibility. And I was making the case that as long as every day we were faithful to purpose, that we were doing this to the best of our abilities, that our intentions were sound, some good would always come of it. And he kind of reluctantly agreed. I did point out, too, that it, had that been day one of the campaign, he would have been taking me out to dinner to celebrate, because $25,000 is a lot of money. It's all relative in, in, in terms of the perspective. So he agreed to sort of see this as um, that some good might come of it. Well, what ended up happening, unbeknownst to us, was a few short months later, that donor was at a, a class party, and he ran into a long-lost friend from New York. And he said, hey, you should, you should hear what's happening in terms of Catholic life at Yale. It's totally transformed from our day. Really exciting things. That donor in New York called me up and introduced himself. He was nowhere in our database, nowhere on Yale's landscape. No one knew about him. And he said, I'd really love to meet you and Father Bob and just hear more about it. So that began a relationship with him. He ended up, after um, meeting with us, saying, I'd like to leave $5 million in my will to St. Thomas More. And furthermore, if you need it now to pay off construction bills for the new center while you wait for additional pledges to come in, I'm happy to loan it to you interest-free. Just pay me back as the other donations come in. I'll reinvest it and leave it to you in my, in my will. Now this man, we would have never met if we hadn't gone to Boston. So I loved, I mean, poor Father Bob hates it when I use this as an example in, in a talk like this, but, but it was just so illustrative of, of being faithful uh, to purpose. And it reminds me that in my own spiritual life, life, the hardest task is to be passionately invested in being Christ-like and radically detached from the outcome passionately invested, and yet radically detached. How hard that is, at least for me, because if you're going to give your entire self to something, you like to imagine what, it will, what the outcome will be. Every single time I have tried to imagine that, my imagination paled in comparison to God's, and I always got the timing off. So passionate investment, radical detachment. Nine, these are not always easy days to be Catholic. They are not easy days to serve the church. They are really not easy days to be a Catholic woman who loves the church. Um, but my advice is, remember what it is you love most about the church. Name it, claim it, let it sustain you. It helps separate out what is extraneous. It keeps you grounded on what is so incredibly valuable about this faith community to which we belong. 
tent. Uh, hopefully, um, through stewardship and through our engagement, yeah, and this is something that the Roundtable is committed to, uh, we should honor and foster the baptismal rights and responsibilities of all of the faithful. Um, this leads to evangelization, when you recognize someone for the talent that they possess, not their checkbook, but their competency, their skill, and you invite it into service in helping address some of the challenges our church is facing, the consequences of evangelization, and the consequence of failing to recognize those talents and enlist them in service to the church is the opposite. I believe that one byproduct of the work of the Leadership Roundtable is that there will be a lessening of the chasm between the left and the right. Frankly, I think the vitriol on both sides is totally inappropriate to people who are called to gather around one Eucharistic table. And although that is not our mission, I hope it's one of those fruits um, that comes of faithful engagement. So greater participation, uh, taking on these complex challenges. If we really believe in God and trust in providence, there is no challenge we cannot solve. I mean, let's just remember that we actually believe in God. Eleven, um, be positive and laudatory. I try to banish cynicism whenever I see it. Uh, people of faith are confident in the future. There was amazing amounts of cynicism that I encountered in my work at Yale, and I see cynicism in my work with the Leadership Roundtable. But this reminds me of my favorite definition of a cynic. A cynic is one who has given up, but not yet shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes well with another favorite quote of mine, the person who says it cannot be done should not interrupt the person doing it. <laughs> so, um, finally, be the church you want to see. Jim and Leah last night, um, as such gracious hosts, they took me to the Idaho Anne Frank Human Rights Memorial here in Boise, and I just fell in love with that. And one of the many inspiring quotes is, from Gandhi, be the change you want to see. Well, I think we can be the church we want to see and not be apologetic about it. Strive for excellence. We know what the church is capable of, but we are the church. Be the church you want to see. Exercise faith-filled imagination. Emulate what you advocate. Be transparent, welcoming, participatory, accountable open and above all relevant, especially to people who are marginalized and to young adults. Imagine how much can be accomplished when no one cares who gets the credit. And I am um, just about out of time. We have 10 minutes. There are microphones there, but I, I, I just in closing want to commend you for your lives of dedication and service, not just to the church, but through the church to helping meet so many needs in a broken world. There is great suffering out there, and your example and your leadership and your own fidelity to purpose is allowing the church's mission to flourish. So I'm humbled to be in your presence. I will keep you in prayer, and I thank you very much for inviting me to be with you. If anybody wants to make a comment or, or question, there are two microphones. I, I'll unfortunately have to cut us off right at 1.30 because I know people have planes and long drives ahead. So, any comments? I promise I won't call on you. <laughs> Okay, so bless you and thank you very much.